Yeah, well, welcome to the Bugwick Historical Microcomputer Museum here in Floyd, Virginia. This museum represents about 45 years of collecting microcomputers and electronic memorabilia. And we have about 3% of it displayed here in the museum. Some of the more significant items, not all of them. But it's a small museum. We have a lot of visitors, and uh, they're always fascinated with the early microcomputers. Our collecting history basically is microcomputer. We did not get into the big computers. So we basically started with the first uh, microcomputer, microprocessor, the 4004, and uh, you know the Mark 8, Apple Ones, and so forth. So our computer museum here is uh, a representation of the early microcomputer history. This is one of my favorite computers here in the museum. It's the Mark 8. It's my favorite computer because it was designed by my colleague John Titus, and we worked together during the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, John designed his computer, the Mark 8, while he was a graduate student at Virginia Tech in the same department that I taught in for 33 years. We were talking about John Titus's computers. As a Blacksburg group, John designed several teaching computers, or development computers, training computers. <clears throat> this is one based on the 8080. This is another one of John's designs. This was the first effort of the Blacksburg Group, and John Titus was the designer of this computer. We were thinking many computers at the time. This is based on the 8080 microprocessor, so it was designed with switches and lights, just like a regular mini computer. Turned out that wasn't really the way to go for microcomputers. It had multiple cards, was a bit expensive, and it brought out all the signals so you could interface to the computer to other devices. And uh, we sold a number of these through e &L Instruments. Well, after the Mark 80 computer, which was a little expensive, we had a lot of cards, we decided it would be better to have a single board computer. And John designed this <clears throat> MMD1 computer based on the 8080. And it was given uh, credit as being the first single board computer, I mean a total computer with an input keyboard, light output, memory, in other words, a self-contained operating computer. So this is one of the 10 prototypes that was built, and we are just delighted to have one of them here in our museum. Here's an early microprocessor called the Jolt. This is, happens to be the Super Jolt. It's in the original box. And I'm particularly interested in the Super Jolt because it was designed by Ray Holt. Now, Ray Holt designed the first microprocessor back in, in the late 60s as a control computer for the F-14 Tomcat aircraft. Well, we talked about the Mark 8 computer that John designed and published in Radio Electronics in 1974. Well, a competing publication called Popular Electronics wanted to have a competing article, so they contacted Ed Roberts, who designed this Altair 8800 and published an article in uh, January of 1975 in Popular Electronics based on the 8080 microprocessor chip. It was a complete kit we got all the parts to build a very minimum computer, but it was sort of like a mini computer in the sense of a light register, switch register, but it was a functioning computer. I mentioned uh, John Titus's Mark 8, and this is, this is a Mark 8 here we talked about, uh, just the raw boards, not in a case. I mentioned it was in the Smithsonian. This computer you see in front of you here is an exact copy of the Mark 8 that's in the Smithsonian. It's an exact copy with switches, lights, the whole thing, exact copy. And this was made by Ray Justice uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, Ray was a student of mine. We have a lot of fascinating computers here in our museum and collection. This one's particularly fascinating. It's the data point 2100. Or actually, this is a 2200. We have a 2100 as well. This computer was designed in the late 60s. It's not a microprocessor chip, but it's an 8-bit microcomputer where the computer is built with discrete components. It was designed to replace the electromechanical teletype, and they call this the glass teletype. It has the same footprint as a mechanical teletype. What's so interesting about this computer is we've been corresponding with Jack Frasinato, who was one of the founders and designers of this computer and one of the founders of the company, still living, still having um, a lot of conversation with him. The interesting story here is that this is an 8-bit micro, not a microprocessor, it's an 8-bit computer, fully functional, programmable, 
And basically the first use of this computer was a chicken farmer that took this computer and wrote software for it to write payroll checks for his employees. The employees didn't like to wait two weeks that it would take for the corporate to send checks back to the farms. And of course that company happened to be Pillsbury. So the farmers could take this computer with the software and write payroll checks the same day they were due. What's even more interesting though is that the 8-bit computer in here, uh, Jack Fascinato and his associates went to Intel in 1970 and said, could you make a microprocessor chip or put all the logic of this computer on a single chip? Well, at Intel, um, they weren't real interested because they thought that would be competing with their memory business, but they did agree to do a design for $50,000. They would put the computer logic on a single chip. Well, it took them a while to actually get that chip developed. In the meantime, the data point was selling a lot of computers. They decided to just continue selling them as they were without the microprocessor chip. Uh, data, the um, data point people had also gone to Texas Instruments at the same time and said, will you build us a chip based on this logic? Well, when they decided not to use the chip, there was a, some discussion within data point what to do with that $50,000 they owed Intel. Well, what happened was the, the ruling group, and Jack Frostinato said he did not want to do this, but they gave the rights to that design to Intel for not paying the $50,000. That chip is now was the first 8-bit microprocessor. That was the 8008 microprocessor chip that Intel developed and sold in 1972. So this computer was designed three years before that, used the same logic. So the first 8-bit microcomputer by Intel came from here. This is the Selby computer, which was advertised in March of 1975, which was a few months before John Titus had his article in Radio Electronics on the Mark 8. So this is arguably one of the first uh, microcomputer kits available. I'm not sure the full kit was available when they advertised it, but Matt Wadsworth and his associates designed this computer. Uh, they sold about 200 of them. There's only about eight or ten of them known to still exist. It had five or six cards. This one's actually custom made with some other cards. And one thing, notice it's in a wooden frame. People who built these early microcomputers used all sorts of construction materials because they didn't come with a case. And people were so anxious to have their own computer, they did a lot of things that we wouldn't consider doing today. Uh, this computer was actually a 8008 computer microprocessor had a switch register, keyboard, and came with a manual. Like I said, Nat Wadsworth was a major designer on this. Well, of course, we're very pleased and proud to have as our museum collection four original Apple I computers. We don't keep them here in the museum. We keep them in the bank vault uh, downtown at the bank. But I brought them out today for the photo shoot. And um, people always ask, uh, how did you acquire four Apple I computers? Well, the story is a bit long, but the short of the story is I didn't do it yesterday. I've been collecting computers for 40 years. I advertised for many years, probably 25 years, uh, that I wanted uh, pre-1980 computers. And these Apple Ones, I was offered about 10 Apple Ones over that period. And these four I bought in the early 90s, over 20 years ago. And at that time, Apple One computers were selling between ten and thirty thousand dollars. They were kind of expensive even then. Of course, much more now. They're all in very nice condition. Uh, this one here I bought from John Birch, who had it had bought it with a case. And we're going to show you the case in a minute. It's a very pristine computer with no modifications. Beautiful Apple One, and uh, we bought that from John. John Birch. This Apple One is just an Apple One board. You notice that there's no chips in it. I had a call from a fellow, uh, Dustin, and he said, I've got two Apple Ones. And I thought it was probably a spoof call. This was around 1995 as well. He said, right, I don't want to sell them right now, but he said, at some point I do. Would you be interested? I said, well, I'd certainly like to talk to you. So I kind of buzzed it off as being a, just a crank call. 
He called me up about a year later and he said, well, David, he said, uh, I've got two kids in college. I need some money. He said, uh, I've got the two computers. I said, great. I said, how much you want for them? He gave me a figure and I said, well, I can't do quite that much. I can't pay for all your kids going to school. But uh, <laughs> we did agree on a price and I got both computers and they're very nice. Um, so we call these the Dustin computers. By the way, all of our computers are on the Apple registry, uh, Mike Willigal's Apple registry. And um, they're all pretty much original. When I say pretty much, we did substitute a couple parts on one. Very nice computer. This one has a little bit of mod on it, or addition, no modification, but a beautiful specimen. And uh, this one here is also one of the ones I bought from Dustin. And when Haggy up in Leesburg, Virginia, has just restored this to working condition. This Apple One computer is the one I bought from Mr. Birch, John Birch. Said it's a beautiful specimen of an Apple One computer with no modifications, just a very nice specification. Uh, of course, I've taken it out of the case. When I bought it, it came in this case. Beautiful uh, example of a case. Here's the power transformers and so forth that power the computer and a keyboard up here that plugs into it. So it's a functioning computer. Well, this is an Apple II. It's called the Black Apple II. And it's uh, private labeled by Bell and Howe. It's just an Apple II computer painted black with the Bell and Howe logo. This came about early on in the Apple II because uh, Job wasn't sure he could sell into the school market and he wanted to penetrate that market. Of course, the Apple II uh, started selling very quickly quite early on and he realized he didn't need Bell and Howe, so he did away with the contract. So there's a number of these so-called so -called black apples out there, Bell and Howe. They're quite collectible. They're not real rare, but there's certainly not a lot of them out there. Of course, Steve uh, Wozniak designed the Apple I. He also designed this Apple II. Um, totally uh, independent. I think Steve Jobs had some uh, input on the case, but the computer itself was uh, designed by Steve Wozniak, and they, s they started to design it actually before they sold all their Apple Ones. Uh, this is the Black Apple, sold by Bell and Howe. It's just a private label of the Apple II. Uh, this is a little bit of our Apple display here. Down here is the Apple III. It was never a uh, successful computer. It never worked very well. It was supposed to be a humdinger, but it just didn't work well at all. And over here is the Apple Lisa. This is a Lisa II. We don't have a Lisa I. This is one of the early uh, GUI or graphic user interface computers, but it sold for $10,000. So again, it didn't become very popular because it was so expensive people couldn't fundamentally afford it. Here's a Macintosh. It was a very, very popular computer, late 80s and 90s. The Blacksburg Group in the uh, mid-70s, early 80s, created a series of about 75 books. Um, the book series started with Bug Books 1 and 2, and this started with Professor Roney, who was working with me uh, at the time, and we were teaching digital electronics, and there were no uh, good books that taught elect digital electronics right around the integrated circuit. So we decided it would be a good idea to write some experiments right around the chip itself, even before the microcomputer I worked with a fellow named uh, Professor Ray Desi, and we did micro. Uh, we did many computer workshops using the PDP-8, and we continued doing workshops up until the early 90s, along with a lot of other people I worked with: um, Chris Titus, John Titus, Paul Field, uh, Ray Desi, Peter Roney, and probably others. But we did workshops through Virginia Tech. We did a lot of independent workshops, and we. I figure we probably uh, taught several hundred, maybe more, workshops over the years because we did an awful lot of them. Uh, this computer here is a Re uh, Recomp 2 made by Autonetics, designed in 1958. Now this is a historic computer from the standpoint that it's considered to be the first commercial transistorized computer. There were other transistor computers before but not sold commercially. Several interesting things about this. Number one, I worked at Autonetics the summer of 1960 between my freshman and sophomore year of college, and I worked on the Minuteman 1 missile computer. Well, part of our museum 
does include a small electronic collection for the crystal radios uh, on up through vacuum tubes and so forth. Here you see a few ham radios. I got my interest in around 1950 or a little earlier when I was about uh, 12 years old, maybe even in 48 when I was 10, I had a crystal radio. When I was 14 years old, 15 years old, I, 1954, I um, got my first amateur radio license. I'll talk a little bit about this tube collection. Over the years, I've had many collectors contact me about uh, purchasing their collection and saving it. And this is one of them. This gentleman that had this tube collection contacted me, oh, 10 or 12 years ago. And he said, David, he said, I'm uh, retiring, uh, going into a nursing home. He said, I have this tube collection. I've been a tube engineer for, for years. But he said, I don't want it dispersed. I'd like to keep it together. And would you, would you buy it from me? And we did make a deal. OK, here's a carbon filament Edison bulb that has the logo um, Edison GE on it. Down here is a carbon filament. Well, this is carbon filament, too. But here's a carbon filament Edison bulb and another one back here. The first bulbs were carbon filaments. They didn't last very long, but uh, that was the way he uh, invented the tube. You know, he went through 10,000 designs before he found a vacuum tube that would, or, well, it was a vacuum tube light bulb. But just a bit about our calculator collection here. We have 100 calculators on display, electronic calculators. I have mechanical calculators, but these are all electronic calculators. Um, I didn't personally gather these. My brother was an antique collector for many years, and every time he would see one at a flea market or whatever, he would buy it. And early on, you know, in the 80s and 90s, they were readily available, but uh, they soon became where it was pretty hard to find them unless you buy them on eBay or someplace like this. Um, moving out. Should be more emotional in a sense, but you know the emotion for me is that uh, I'm really thrilled to see this stuff go somewhere where it will be used much more than just sitting on a shelf. Now I'm sure not all of it will be used, but it'll be where it can be used with an active museum. My museum here in Floyd is very, very teeny, and uh, we just couldn't use hardly any of our inventory and put it on display, so I'm just uh, real happy to see this inventory go to a, a large, uh, really a great museum that can utilize a whole lot more of it than I did and, and keep this technology uh, for the future and, and show it off and uh, teach people what, what happened in the past. And it's, I think it's a great thing. So I'm mostly I'm, I'm really glad to see it move on to, to better a better place, really. It's wonderful. And I, I need to call.